Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this Ask Alumni Live Career Conversation. Are you looking after yourself, mindfulness, resilience, and mental focus? This event is part of a series of live, live streamed events planned for this year to provide the alumni community insightful career advice and resources, especially in these challenging times. My name is Zainab Karashi, and I'm the president of the Melbourne Population and Global Health Student Society. I'm a current Master of Public Health student and a science honours graduate from the University of Melbourne. I will be completing my public health degree in the next year, and despite having plans to continue my study at studies afterwards, I am sure that the public health component of my future career will surely be very different thanks to the events of this year. So I hope to personally get a lot out of this event. I would like to begin our time together today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, as well as the traditional owners of the land you are situated on and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and waterways of Australia for thousands of years. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. The Ask Alumni Live series is designed to address the needs of alumni as you move through your career. So whether you are taking your first career steps or looking for change, we hope you will find this session useful. Tonight, as we approach Are You OK Day on Thursday 10th of September, we ask the question, are you looking after yourself? COVID-19 has imposed on us, on all of us, one of um, the greatest health challenges of our time, now becoming one of the greatest economic challenges. Looking after our mental health has never been more important. Our experts tonight will share their insights by prioritizing in, insights into prioritizing mental health and resilience through uncertainty and at every stage of your career and share their professional and personal strategies for balancing demands, demanding careers while sustaining mental well-being. I am joined today by Professor Brock Bastian, a social um, psychologist whose research focuses on pain, happiness and, mortality, uh, and morality and a University of Melbourne psychology, psychology and PhD alum, Dr. Sophie Adams, who is a psychiatrist and clinical director with Origin. Um, she oversees five headspace centres and a university, and she's also a University of Melbourne graduate. Um, Martin Heppel, um, who is a partner and facilitator with the Resilience Project, as well as um, being a former teacher and an AFL player and a University of Melbourne Education alumna, alum, and Dr. Sky Kinder, who is a trainee psychiatrist. Sky was named 2019 Young Victorian of the Year for, for her advocacy for junior doctor welfare, and she's also a University of Melbourne Medical School graduate. Thank you for joining us today, Brock, Sophie, Martin and Skye. We've had a large number of questions submitted by you um, ahead of this session and we will try to cover some of those during our discussion. But please do feel free to pose questions through the Q&A window as we go and we'll, sit, we'll set aside some time at the end to answer those questions. So now on to the discussion. Brock, you've done a lot of work to understand the value of negative and painful experiences and why they're critical to achieving happiness. That seems very relevant to our current situation. So how might we reflect on these sorts of challenging and stressful circumstances to improve our well-being? Yeah, I, I mean, it is, it is very relevant, particularly, I think, you know, as we're all in Melbourne at least, any of us, I think we're all in Melbourne, are we? Um, are looking into six more weeks, and I think we're still kind of trying to process exactly what that is, what it's going to be like, and how we're going to get through it. It's been a very difficult year, and and a lot of lot of challenges. Um, I guess from from you know from the research that I've done, and, and some of the um, you know the, the research of others as well. I think one of the, the really important things is to I guess have a have a way of looking at this year that provides for some nuance and for some different perspectives. Obviously, it's bad and it's obviously difficult and it's obviously something that we probably would, well, definitely would prefer not to have had to deal with. But having said that, that doesn't mean that there can't also be, uh, you know, some things that could come out of it which are positive. Um, and I think when you can look to those things, when you can accommodate those and, and I guess, integrate them into your, into your response, I mean, the fact is in life we're going to always have challenges. It's how we respond to them that matters. 
So, you know, a couple of things that are coming out. I mean, I think the, the connection that we're having, I mean, right now it's very difficult because of social isolation, but as we come out of that, I mean, this will be a, a talking point, a point of connection of shared experience for years and years to come, um, having, having all been through it together. And we know that these sorts of experiences do bring people together. They elicit pro-social behaviour. We are seeing that in our community. Again, somewhat dampened by, you know, all of the restrictions at the moment, but I think we'll continue to sort of see that, that flourish. Uh, you know, other other aspects or other viewpoints. All right. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties with Brock. Um, thank you for your insights, Brock. Um, completely agree with the points that you've made. Moving on to Sophie. Sophie, you are the coalface providing direct mental health support for members of our community, particularly through the COVID-19 stage four and stage four lockdowns in Melbourne. How do you help your clients manage stressful and challenging situations? Oh, with as much humour and kindness as I can, I think, is the short answer. Um, we're all in this together. And I think mental health workers, as much as anyone else, feel quite stressed by the circumstances. And I think being honest and open about that is, is helpful. Um, we all need to practice some basic things. We need to manage uncertainty. We need to have meaningful connection. And we need to have something to fight for. And I think, I think that's sort of what Brock was getting at when he got cut off, is that, that need to have a real you know, focus and reflection and something to hold on to that, that makes some of this worthwhile. You know, psychiatry is actually really simple. Like the basis is basically be kind, have clear boundaries, be curious. If something isn't working, try something else and instill hope. And I think it's the instilling hope that we try very hard to do with young people, um, but within ourselves as well, every minute or every day. <laughs> Definitely. Um, moving on to Martin. Now, Martin, you have a particularly unique background going up in Borno, six years playing professional AFL and a career in primary education, and now with the Resilience Project. I imagine many of these experiences have presented unique challenges. How have you managed your own mental health across your professional and personal life? Uh, I think by being in many different environments, I've had to adapt. And I think adapting has been something that's really benefited me in all environments that I've been in. Um, my self-worth has always remained intact. I had a lot of connections. Uh, Brock was talking about connections before. When I was um, when football finished, when I changed schools, when I moved and lived in different countries, I maintained relationships. If one relationship faltered, broke down, I still had others to fall back on. So my self-worth was always intact because I knew that if something occurred in one environment, it wouldn't necessarily impact another. I think failure for me is growth. I don't fear it. Um, if I stuff this up tonight, I really, you know, with all due respect, I care, but what can I do about it? I can get better. Yeah. And I think that's a really big one for a lot of us is that we're forever fearful of judgment. For me, my judgment's been okay. I don't fear it because my self-worth is intact, but also my morals and values. Um, that they, You know, uh, Sophie, Sophie talked about hope, you know, gratitude, massive, focusing on what I've got, being there, being in the moment. And um I think forever just looking forward to a challenge. And I've had positive experiences from being in challenges before. I've experienced adversity. I haven't always got through it, but because I have gotten through many other times in my world, I've got a, I've got a positive, I suppose, experience that I can recall on. It gives me, I suppose, hope that I can then, when I am experiencing adversity again in the future, I'll be able to get through. Therefore, I persist. Definitely a really good point. I think it's really important to keep focused and to have hope because these circumstances may happen, but, I mean, you can only look towards the future. Um, moving on to Sky. Sky, you are working on the front line and embarking on your residency in psychiatry, an incredibly stressful and demanding time in your young doctor's career, and I'm sure, you, uh, I'm sure you've made even more, and this has been made even more complex in the context of COVID. You've been a strong advocate for the welfare of young doctors. How are you managing the stress and the demands of your early career? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's an interesting um, uh, question. And I, um, uh, I spoke with The Age um, a couple of weeks ago about this sort of e exact topic. And in particular, you know, one of the narratives that's uh, common in the media at the moment, which is that the healthcare workers on, on the front line are heroes. Um, and I suppose one of the things that I spoke about was, you know, while it's obviously um, an amazing privilege to, to work in health, and um, it's amazing that the community is celebrating us in, in the way that they are, that narrative, I think, actually makes it 
slightly more difficult for um, those of us working in the profession to acknowledge that actually we're having a really difficult time too. Um, we, we work a different job than everyone else, but fundamentally, you know, th this pandemic is affecting us really in the same ways um, as, as everybody else. And, you know, that's an example of a particular narrative from, from the healthcare space, but I think there are similar narratives that other people are experiencing in other spaces as well. Um, you know, the uh, one of my patients uh, often refers to it as, you know, the toxic positivity of Instagram, the, oops, sorry, that is my cat. Um, <laughs> That that is an that that's a, an important well-being point we'll get to later. But <laughs> um, you know the the ISO baking, um, you know the needing to achieve uh, more than ever. You know at a moment where actually some of us are struggling to get out of bed. Um, and so I think an important part of it for me and I think for my colleagues has just been recognizing actually that we're all human. Um, none of us really know what we're doing in this pandemic because we've never experienced anything like it before, and that's okay. Um, that's actually okay. Yeah, and that's definitely right. I mean, these standards that are set on social media, they just really get to us sometimes and they make you feel like you're not doing enough, which is so sad because it's just a snippet of these people's lives. Um, now I've got some further questions. Um, Sophie, we'll start with you. So maintaining um, good mental health is important to prioritize, to prioritize during st stressful times in our lives. What are the warning signs that things are going wrong and what are some strategies for developing uh, good mental health? Sure, you know that's a, like a couple of lectures, but I'll try and you know, break it down to a few kinds. Of We've points. got a curious audience. Look, you know, we all know when we're not going so well most of the time, but sometimes we don't notice, and I think it's the subtle signs that are really worth paying attention to at the moment, like you know, being more irritable, being more tense, procrastinating more, changes in how we're kind of functioning. But even things like, you know, how angry do we feel with Dan Andrews right now? You know, if if what you're feeling is a very intense version of the way you normally are, then maybe it's time to take stock and, and look after yourself a little bit more. And if we can do those things early on, then it won't get to the point where we're not functioning. And I think, you know, the, the main thing is that we can keep going. And when we talk about you know, how we're going to manage this, it most of it is very straightforward self-care. Like it's almost, I, every all the people listening, they know, they know what to do. That they, they, it's, whether we do it or not, that is the key bit. And, you know, you've got to control what you can. You've got to find ways to cope with the uncertainty. You've got to have a routine and a schedule for human beings. They just do better when life is a bit more predictable and everything's so unpredictable at the moment that a schedule is important. You need mm. to move your goalposts a bit closer. So instead of thinking, you know, this year I was going to climb Mount Everest and get that career job and do this other thing, you need to say, what actually can I achieve and pull your GoPros? And it might be I'm going to get up every morning this week and go for a walk. It might be something actually much more achievable that you can celebrate. And then rewarding yourself, um, doing movement, having exercise. I believe in green space. I, I love to travel. I love to be outside. I think green space is healing. Um, and also meaning, so supporting other people. I really think, and, you know, obviously I'm in psychiatry, and so is Sky, you know, we, and I think everyone here, Brock and Martin as well, we all look after people for a living, um, and that is a very meaningful job to do. Um, it gives you a lot of benefits, and it makes a big difference. So when the chips are down and you're not coping, at least there's a very good reason to get up and to look out for others. So I think anything that anyone can do, whether it's your job or whether it's just in your family, reach out to those other people, try mm. help them. And if you do that, then you will feel a little bit more in control and a little bit better about yourself. And that might just be what makes a difference. Definitely. And kind of leeching on to what you were just saying, what, what kind of self-care um, things do you do for yourself and do you have any professional advice or support? Yeah, well, for myself, I go for a walk every morning. My GP was quite impressed when I said four to six K every morning at the moment. Um, it's the only time that I have time to myself where I'm not looking after others. And I listen to audible books and I read and I, I personally, I love sci-fi and uh, fantasy and thinking about 
what would the world be like if things were different? I think actually can be really helpful at this sort of time. Um, in terms of seeking help, obviously I run some headspaces. So headspace is a great place to contact. There's stuff online. Beyond Blue is also a very well resourced at the moment to help people who are struggling. Um, and, and a lot of people are seeking help who've never saw help before. And I think the main message is that we're all in this together. Even the mental health staff, we're all seeking help from each other. We're ringing each other up. We're Zooming after work. We're, we're doing little things for each other to try and help. Um, so you shouldn't feel in any way uh, any shame or embarrassment about seeking help. Please do it. If you have any doubts and you haven't got people with you that can help you, please reach out. The person you reach out to is just like you and they're getting some meaning from it. So, so please take that step. Definitely. Um, and Sky, you're on the front line as well. And uh, could you tell me what kind of role self-care plays in your life and do you, if you have and what the difference is in terms of when you give professional advice and support? Um, well, I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, we're probably a bit better at uh, giving the professional advice than we are to applying it to ourselves sometimes. And, and that's something that I do need to remind myself often. I know that's a very common experience. I'm sure that you know, there are a number of people um, listening along who, if they had a friend come and ask them what to do in a particular situation, would know exactly what to say, but wouldn't necessarily apply it to their own lives. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, it is really important, um, you know, to, to use the, um, you know, aeroplane analogy, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can help other people, because otherwise you just... Um, it, if your own tank is running low, um, you, you just don't have a lot to give. Um, and I think it's about finding things for you that actually um, work for you. Um, it, you know, for me, uh, I really enjoy, although I'm not necessarily good at uh, interior decorating. Uh, and so flicking through Instagram mindlessly, looking at pretty pictures of houses is actually a really great way to sort of recharge the batteries, particularly if I've been dealing um, with sort of less superficial, more intense um, content at, at work um, or, or even just the, the day-to-day stresses, sometimes having that space that you can go to um, where there's no expectations um, and uh, not a lot of meaning uh, even um, and, and just sort of chill out uh, is really useful, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, now moving on to Brock, in the context of work and job seeking, how can we remain resilient? in the face of rejection and how can some of these painful experiences help us in the long term? Yeah, um, yeah. I guess job seeking is going to get a whole lot harder, isn't it, as we, as we go through and particularly for um, younger people who are, you know, in insecure employment and maybe looking to launch careers at the moment, which is going to be very difficult. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think one really important thing, and, and this is probably a broader point anyway, is, is um, to remember, to remember that we're going through a 100-year event pandemic, and you know, if we're if we're not if we're not coping, if we're not dealing with it well, if we're failing, if we're not finding work, if we can't get a job, um, it's not because of who we are or what we like, or because of some sort of quality or characteristic or aspect of ourselves. It's it's because of the the context. Um, and the context is really difficult. And, and so we've got to kind of remember, I think too quickly we attribute things to ourselves when we should be, particularly at the moment, contributing it to the context. And um, so, yeah, that, I mean, those, those experiences of failure and rejection are going to be difficult for people because there will be more of them uh, moving forward. And so just remembering, yeah, remembering that context, remembering that, you know, that, that this is something that is actually a really difficult time. Um, but again, as, you know, I, I think also, and I think Martin was, was pointing to this as I was slowly reconnecting my internet, um, but you know that the, these sorts of experiences do offer, you know, they offer an opportunity for growth. You know, experiencing these these sort of knockbacks, kickbacks, we get you know experiences of failure and these sorts of things. If we respond to them well, if we pick ourselves up and move forward, um, you know, we do start to realise, okay, I got through that. Um, I, I, I know what I'm capable of, um, and and there is the opportunity there for growth and building strength and resilience as well. So, mm. remembering that probably is good too. Mm, definitely. And leaching on to the topic of resilience, Martin, resilience is a skill that we learn over time. Tell us what resilience is and how building resilience can help us during stressful times in our lives. And can resilience be tested before anxiety is triggered? Um, I think, you know, Brock 
basically just was talking about it then it's it's everyone's got different you know words they might use it's dealing with adversity it's bouncing back at you in a hole getting out it's knowing what to do i think that the big thing about why resilience is so important during stressful times is that the, the key to resilience quite often also that um can be neglected is positive emotions you've got to have positive emotions we've got to find them and we've got to find them every day like right now i'm looking out my window about 15 minutes before and it was a beautiful pink sky now, lockdown cannot stop me from looking out the window. Mm. Yeah, and Brock was talking about that before as well. And they're the things that we've got to find. You've got to find the small wins in your world, and we do have them. It's getting your eyes up, and it's about seeing them. Positive emotions allow you to persist. Negative emotions we have to deal with. We have to, to function well, you have to deal with negative emotions. You have to experience them. But it's the positive emotions that will allow you to persist. Not every day is going to be good. Not every moment is going to be good. But if you can find those positive emotions, you then persist. In terms of um, resilience being tested before anxiety is triggered, look, I reckon the other, um, you know, Sophie, Sky and Brock be better than me. But, look, it's often uncertainty. It's often overwhelming and competing demands, and it's also often social discomfort where anxiety is triggered. Now, if resilience is asked of you without any of those three being put into play, then maybe. We work with kids. Why are we so passionate about working with kids and doing school programs is to give them the skills early on. The key, though, with resilience is this, and it's, it's beautiful if you can see it through this lens, is that when you are experiencing adversity and we are all experiencing it possibly now, yeah, and remember, we all define things differently. Like I've got, I know kids have just left school and they're on JobKeeper and they're on $750 a week playing PS4, Xbox, having the time of their lives. Like they don't want this to ever end, all right? So it is personal trauma. It's an external factor you can't control, yeah? However, however, if we do get through this and we are defining this as being an adverse situation, then guess what? When you experience it again in the future, we can go back to 220. We can say what got us through. Let's put it into play again. And you know what? That is growth. And mm -hmm. I would argue, hey, it might just be something that you look back on, not now, but in 5, 10, 15 years where you say, you know what? That wasn't something that I regret. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I was going to say, Sophie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just want to say that even if you do get really stressed, you do get overwhelmed, you do get anxious, all is not lost. Like that's just part of the human condition. That's part of how we learn and grow. Uh, Mark was talking about being happy to fail and try again. It's all the same stuff. So if things feel really out of control, it, 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 it doesn't mean that you weren't resilient. It just means that at that point in time, the emotions got a bit out of control. But that resilience is standing back and going okay let's try again and 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 there's many times to try again you don't have to try again tomorrow or the next day you can try again in a week or two weeks or a year there's lots of time to process these things and it doesn't we don't have to be in control at the moment in fact we can't be so um you know just accepting that it's okay if that happens i also see a lot of comments in the chat about how do i broach this with people how do i help my friend family other um and and there is no one way, but I would say that asking works much better than telling. So telling someone you should do this, there's something wrong with you, you know, you need help, works far less well than saying, I notice, I'm worried, why, how, get, tell me more. You know, that's how we do our jobs. We just keep asking questions till the person figures it out for themselves mostly. Um, in my own life, I'm so tempted and I do all the time tell my kids what to do, but really I know that that is not the right way. Mm. I think we all get tempted. It's just we want to help and it's our need to help other, the ones we love that makes us kind of behave in that way. Um, Sky, how important is physical well-being in achieving good mental health and do you have any tips um, for staying active? Sorry, my cat is really enjoying this uh, presentation. Just another example <laughs> of un uncertainty and unpredictability. Um, uh, I mean, physical health is, you know, we know that physical health and, and mental health are in intimately linked um, with each other. Um, and, you know, if you're not taking care of your body, um, it's unsurprising that your mind will be impacted um, as a result of that. Um, 
uh, again, you know, this is an example where um, it's easy for me to say, and it is actually a lot harder to do this sometimes. You know, I find that myself, although I would recommend this a hundred times a day to, to patients that I would see, actually finding time in, in my own day, for example, to um, exercise, you know, to, to think about the food that I'm putting into my body. Um, it, it can be hard um, and, it, you know, it's a process of prioritising. Um, you, you have to, it is a commitment, um, you know, to uh, put your physical health um, and, and your mental health first, uh, you know, above the, all of the other things that we, we're, we're battling with. Um, uh, but I, I also think at, you know, a time like this, it's, it's okay as well to, you know, give in to some of your temptations, to, ha to have the takeaway every now and again and, and to not be too hard on yourself if that's something that you are doing. Um, I, it, sort of on the topic, I guess, of that, that toxic positivity that I mentioned before, you know, looking at everyone else um, eating their, you know, home-baked kale chips um, while you're having, you know, some sneaky Maccas on the couch and feeling really guilty about yourself isn't, um, uh, you know... It, it, it's it's not helping. Um, it, it's okay. We're we're all we're all managing the best that we can. You, every day you get up and and you know as others have sort of alluded to you you try again. But um, if on a particular day it's not working for you, that's also okay. Definitely, um, Sophie. Um, in terms of work, how how might we reframe career goals and maintain the motivation to continue our professional development amidst so much uncertainty? And what role should career ambition play in dramatically in a dramatically reprioritized world? Well, I think that's a really individual experience. Um, absolutely, I noticed that the job dance has stopped. It, everything slowed down. People are not leaving their jobs because there's so many people without jobs. So, um, and, and, and all the people who have not got jobs are actively trying to figure out what, how they can pivot or what they can do differently to get a job. So it's a really fraught time. Um, I would also say, though, that the dance will speed up again. It will come back. And if we just get through this period, and I know it's uncertain how long it will be, but there will be a whole lot of opportunities all very close together because all those jobs that haven't been advertised, all those things that didn't exist are all going to start again. So there's going to be a lot of things to do. It's just a matter of getting to that point. And I would absolutely say prioritise, you know, what you think will make you happy. Um, but times of uncertainty and this is getting back to stuff Martin and Brock both said, are uh, also times of opportunity. And I think that people have had to change so much in the last six months that we're actually all a little bit more open to innovation and to diversity and to doing something outside the box. Actually, this is the time for innovators and creative people and people to pitch ideas and people to say, I, you know, I think we should do it this way. And perhaps for more conservative people to go, hmm, well, we didn't think some other things would work, and they did. So I actually think it's a really good time, but maybe in about four months' time, um, to, to really do something in the world, to think about the big challenges, to think about social justice, to think about climate change, to think about who we are as human beings and, and what we want to contribute to the human race. So actually, I hope very much that it will be a good time for people very soon. I hope so. Um, Martin? Can I add to that? So, yeah, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, um, I, was, I really liked what you said, um, Sophie. It actually um, made me reflect on, you know, the, when you're talking about the dance, I suppose, um, uh, one of the things that I've been finding myself doing uh, as part of this, you know, pandemic process is thinking about whether or not I even want to return to, to, to the dance that I was doing before and actually whether or not the dance I was doing before is that sustainable over the long term and, and whether or not some of the things that I want to see in my life are facilitated as part of that dance that I was doing before. So, um, you know, although it feels like I, you know, I might be a, achieving a lot less in in some ways because as you say you know those, some of those opportunities aren't available at the moment and um, thinking ahead to when they are available again I'm finding myself questioning how, how much do I want to take some of those do I really want to put my energy here or do I want to redirect it somewhere else and so it, it, apart from I think you know um innovating on uh, you know sort of bigger bigger scales as well just innovating in our own lives actually and and making sure that we're um 
you know, focusing our energy on things that we actually want to do rather than being caught up in the dance. Agreed. Can I, can I just add as well that I, and probably I was going to say this before when I, was, when I dropped off, but, you know, I think, I think again, these, what we know from the research is these sorts of experiences are things which actually push people to change their value orientation. So often people move away from extrinsic values more towards intrinsic meaningful values as a result of, you know, being shaken up by something like this. And, and again, that provides a really great opportunity to, to just bring things back and think, okay, what really matters and, you know, what do I really want to do and where are we really going to take this and where is my life going to go, where is this organisation going to go? You know, it offers all sorts of opportunities for pivoting to new, new ideas and opportunities. So, yeah, just to, I think, that, again, that it, it's, the, it's the event itself which actually provides that opportunity as well. Mm. Yeah. Alrighty, um, Martin, how can we keep positive with the inability to forecast and plan? Uh, well, firstly, uh, knowing that every skill set that you pick up during this time is going to benefit you. Adapting, do you think employers don't want people who can adapt? Yeah, so like stay in the moment. You've got to stay in the moment. We, we don't know what the future will be. All right, so I think it's also about... If you're procrastinating, I think being aware, you were talking about before about looking after yourselves, where are you getting your information from? If, if you're on Q&A today, tonight, um, a current affair, you, and you're filling your world with negative thoughts, negative emotions the whole time, that's going to you know, start to impact where you are as well. Small things. We, we, they spoke about exercise before, Sophie and Sky, but also know that music, exercise and laughter, massive. Music and laughter, it's huge. Barbara Freakson talks a lot about it, about verbal fluency and engagement, creativity, you open your information, there's things in your world. Sophie talked about how she's changing up now, picking up new skills, yeah? She's reading a lot more. I'm not saying you weren't before, Sophie, okay? But I, but, I mean, there's things that we can do right now. Jump on board, find the positives, yeah? I know that, um, that you know, in terms of the na natural world is so important to you. Reconnect with nature. Yeah, we talk about connection. Connection's huge. I mean, I know it's going to be coming up a bit later, but connecting with your peers, with your family, but taking a walk in, within the five, five Ks that you're allowed to do. So, But if you can get to the beach, how much better do you feel when you go to the beach? How much better do you feel when you walk through the bush? It's, it's something that we've got to be able to maintain, and that is being the moment. So... Sophie talked before about being in control. I don't control what the government tell me to do, but I do control my backyard, yeah? So that's what I'm going to control. And I'm going to continue to control that until my backyard gets a little bit bigger. And when it gets a bit bigger, depending on the size of it, then I'll put into play some strategies that I can implement, yeah, that will support me in that bigger backyard. Definitely. Um Next, we have a question for Brock. So for many, workload and stress um, has increased considerably um, during COVID. Our days are constantly interrupted by emails, text messages, notifications, news updates, background noise, children, pets, family members, co-workers, and more. Um, we are often working on multiple tasks, projects, assignments, and towards tight deadlines. How can we put this to, uh, to the side and sharpen our focus to help us achieve our goals when we need to? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the kind of uh, the uncertainty, the complexity, the, um, you know, the, the stress, all of it is a sort of perfect storm in some, in some ways. Um, I, think, I think some practical strategies there are just, I mean, um, using good structure in your day and making sure that you, you, you structure your day. I think, I think when we use a good behavioural routine and try and put structure around that, um, it actually helps with the thoughts and the emotions and keeps them in place a little bit as well. Um, it, it provides a little bit of a containment point for that. Um, so, uh, again, trying to use, you know, not, I think one of the things that I'm noticing at least is, I mean, I'm incredibly efficient. I'm able to jump between one meeting to the next in a nanosecond. Um, no walking, no travelling, no nothing. I mean, bang, I'm there. And I mean, I'll be off this into another meeting afterwards. It's like, that, you know, it's incredible. But, of course, I'm working a lot more because of it too. So... What, what are you going to do with that spare time? You know, if, if we are saving time, maybe we should put it into, you know, doing something like, um, you know, going for a walk, exercising, getting out, doing, doing something for ourselves a little bit just to get away from, from you know, from what we're doing. But, but also having, having a bit of that space. Um, you know, some people are walking to work, even if they're working from home and walking home from work, even if they're working from home. And that's a nice thing to do. 
you know, 15 minutes, um, a little bit of a transition point. Um, you know, you walk through the door, you're ready for what's going to, what are you going to have for dinner and what are you going to say to your kids? If, you know, whatever else, you, you know, whoever else is there. And if there's nobody there, then, you know, at least for you, you've done a ritual. I think rituals are really important as well um, in terms of managing all of this. Um, it, it creates, a, a, you know, something to kind of hang off. So again, I think, I think behavioural routine and structure is really important. It just helps us to keep the rest of that stuff in our heads. And I think rumination at the moment is, you know, going wild. People have got no distraction. So our, our minds are going crazy. Um, it's hard to know how to stop the thoughts. And so that, that's one thing I think we can do. Definitely amazing how you can just block in so many meetings in such a short period of time <laughs> in comparison to before where you had to really schedule them in, make sure they're in close vicinity mm. and, you know, they never took 40 minutes and that's it. No, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah. I live from my, between my five headspace centres. So I would spend an hour, two, three in the day just trying oh. and thinking, nice thoughts mm. about what I was going to do when I got there and what my message was and, I get so much less planning time now because you know, I'm back I'm in the next meeting and I haven't thought who am I and what's my purpose and what am I doing here and what do I want to do, say to these people that I'm going to see. All of that is, and, and maybe I should be putting it in my diary, thinking time, but I haven't as yet, but I do know people that do it and I know people that make all their Zoom calls 45 minutes for a good reason. Yeah. I think it's a good idea because as great as it is to be efficient, you also need those little bits in between, like how we used to walk from building to building or go from location to location. I mean, even just listening to music in the car on the way to your next location helps sometimes. Um, Sky, as early career professionals and maybe even for others, how, I, how might we go about um, asking for support or advice in the workplace without our colleagues or superiors assuming that we are not coping or not able to fulfil our role? And how can managers and workplaces be more supportive of employee welfare? I think it's an interesting question and it's, a, it's very relevant to a number of interest industries, medicine in particular, but there are multiple industries where, where people don't necessarily feel comfortable coming forward to um, ask for help uh, for people, from people in the workplace. I think, you know, there's a couple of things that I'd say and the first thing that I would say is that if your workplace doesn't support you seeking help, then that's actually a reflection of the poor practice of your workplace and not in any way a reflection on you. Um, I, you know, that, that is a workplace that needs to change its culture. You do not need to change your response to, to your distress. <laughs> they need to change their response. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it better, though, in, in the moment when, when you're trying to seek support. Um, but I think it's important to remember deep down somewhere that actually that's, that's them and that's not you. Um, I think from a practical point of view, when you're not sure whether or not your organisation is going to support you, I think it really is about finding that trusted person um, somewhere. Usually, uh, or, or at least hopefully, there will be one person that you can sort of identify that that, that feels trusted, um, that, that, you know, creates a safe space for you to just be who you are. Um, and uh, you know, being vulnerable um, isn't easy, um, but finding that trusted person, I think, is really important um, and really key and, uh, you know, will allow you to feel so much freer um, once you have that conversation. In terms of workplaces, um, creating a more supportive environment, you know, this is something um, that I'm very passionate about. I do a lot of work in this space, particularly uh, when it comes to the well-being of uh, medical students through the, through the University of Melbourne, as it were, um, but also uh, junior doctors as, as well. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, one, one thing that I think is really important is actually senior people in organisations showing vulnerability and, and role modelling how it is that, that you can, um, uh, you know, ask ask for help i suppose and 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 be um fallible rather than than infallible some of the most um i think pivotal moments in my career thus far have been seeing you know senior people in my workplace say yeah hey actually i struggled with this thing um it gave me permission to, to feel like it was okay um, to, to also struggle with things that I struggle with. And we can all actually do that, um, you know, for, for people that are more junior than us by just sharing simple things that um, have been difficult for us or, or sometimes more, more difficult things um, as well. I think, I think that's 
one really simple way. Um, you don't need any funding. You don't really need any resources um, to, to, to make that cultural change. It, it's just about um, setting the example that vulnerability is not only acceptable, but actually welcomed and, and encouraged. Definitely. And it's great to see that you're doing a lot of this mental health work for medical students, especially at the university. Um, it's nice to see young people really stand up for what's right. Um, Martin, now we're moving on to questions that have been asked live. Martin, I've got a question for you. In light of these, in light of um, this whole supporting others kind of um, narrative, what if you see your family struggle um, or the person you live with, um, how do you support them? And how do you, especially when they don't want to hear this good advice? quote unquote good you're on mute man <laughs> good sorry i thought lip reading was ready to go um sophie spoke about this before as well uh, so going back to what she was saying empathy is huge and, and we're not, it's it's so it's about and we know the difference between sympathy and empathy but it's about also highlighting to them that um, you're fully, you, you've experienced those emotions before. Just going on what Sky was speaking about, uh, this is what, whenever I do presentations, I talk to people and I ask them, whoever it was that brought you up, up, did they ever talk to you about their failures? And if they didn't, I'm not giving them any grief. But if they never spoke to you about their failures, you tell me how comfortable you are to talk about yours. All right? So here it is. Judgment, status. Everyone peaks about judgment and status. Therefore, I will tell someone something that maybe in the past I would deem to be shameful if I know they're going to display empathy. But if I fear there's judgment, I'm going to lock it down. I'm not saying a word. So how is your relationship with the person? Because if that relationship isn't solid, they're not going to open up to you. There's no way. So you need to get that core that relationship solid first and then remove the judgment and then speak to them. Yeah? Not tell them what to do, but talk to them about possibly experiences that you've gone through that are similar and how you benefit maybe from talking. Talking is absolutely huge because you've got three experts on this panel right now. And I know this, no, I'm, I'm not one of them, by the way. So let's just be clear there. But they are experts, they're external, and they've got skills and strategies that if I wanted to speak to them, I would benefit from. So break it down. We see a mechanic because our car breaks down. We go see a physio because I've torn my hamstring. I go to an accountant when I'm doing tax. But we say psych, psychiatrist or psych, yeah, we say wellbeing counsellor and everyone freaks out. It's exactly the same. They're elite, they're external, they're professional, yeah? So get into their world, display it, model to them possibly things that you've been through, listen to them, yeah? And then, as Sophie said before, the path will open up for them more often than not. And if, if they fear something, in terms of going to seek counsel from an external person, then why can't we say, hey, I'm going to be there with you. I'm coming with you. I'll sit in that session with you and we'll go through it together. You also uh, need to be an expert to help. I think that's the other thing. Like, thanks for the vote of confidence, Martin. I think we're all being experts. But I'm sure that if I was upset and I went to Sky and I've never met Sky before today and I said, Sky, I have this problem and I talked it through with Sky, even though I, I don't know how many, 15, 20 years older, I'm sure she would have some insight that would help me see it differently. And that's the other thing is, you, you, yes, they're experts and, yes, please seek them out, but we can all do this for each other. We can all listen, we can all ask, we can all be there and we'll all have a different lens that we look at the problem through and that will help trigger reflection. And talking is magic. I, we, don't, we can't tell you exactly why talking helps you process emotions. I could talk a lot about the neuroscience of it, but just talking allows emotions to dissipate. It allows us to process and it takes away the intensity. So it is. It's essentially magic. 
I mean, my, my view on that, Sophie, is that I think it, it forces you to make an objective. It forces you to organise your thoughts in a way that you, means you can communicate it to somebody and they'll understand. And when you have to go through that process, it helps you to clear up your head and work out what's going on in there. I mean, writing is the other, other side of that as well. But, yeah, and again, you know, as, as you pointed out, I mean, you can talk to anyone. If you ask some good questions, people, people are forced to answer them. It's part of the, part of the process. Yeah, so it is um, it's very helpful. Um, I've got a question from the audience that I'm going to throw to the floor. So any of you, please feel free to answer this. Um, so since Dan Andrews' announcement on Sunday, the political landscape seems to have shifted and um, shifted to a more we are not in we are not all in this together narrative. This is contributing greatly to anxiety in the community. How do we convince our leaders to follow the lead of the mental health experts and the model support rather than criticism? Anyone got the answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a really hard time. I would hate to be I would hate to be you know in Daniel Andrews' shoes right now. It's one of those one of those sort of problems that doesn't have an answer, and any answer you come up with creates another problem. Um, it's very difficult, and and I suppose that that's one thing to try and you know everyone should be remembering that this is this is something that's very difficult to get right. Um, and, and so, you know, there may, may be maybe aspects that people aren't getting right, but yeah, it would be, would be good. I don't know how we're going to convince the leaders. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a long way up to yell, but uh, it would be good if there was a little more cohesion um, and, and just a, a general, you know, okay, this is how we're going to do it, to support that. Um, I, I think that's really important. Uh, and it's an important message, actually, for, for the whole of society to, to create that cohesion socially through, through the leadership as, as well. So um, it'd, it'd be nice to see a little more of that. I think one thing that's useful um, for us to remember, and whether or not this convinces politicians uh, is, is another um, thing, but I, I think it's useful for us to remember that sometimes we try to distill other people or, or even ourselves down to sort of a single story, you know, one narrative, um, but actually we're all really complex people and we're actually all allowed to have sometimes, you know, competing or contradictory views around things. Um, you know, I, I absolutely support the restrictions. I think they're, they're, they're difficult but absolutely necessary. At the same time, though, I hate them. <laughs> I find them really difficult. I wish they would end. I wish this would all be over. I wish I understood how we got into this position in the first place better. Um, I'm frustrated. You know, I'm annoyed but I still really support it. And, and those, are, those are in some ways, they feel a bit contradictory at times, but it's, we're actually allowed to be, you know, multidimensional people. Um, and our leaders actually sometimes, I think in the media, get distilled down to being sort of this, this two-dimensional caricature, um, but they're also multidimensional people um, dealing with very complicated issues. So just allowing um, each other and ourselves to um, have more than one narrative, um, I, I think is important. And remembering that people can have more than one narrative. Mm, definitely. Um, I've got another question here. So for young people who are in their final years of school, this year is, has been even more difficult and stressful than normal. Can any of you comment on how you're seeing young people cope at this time and how can we support these young people um, through this current time and through the ongoing impacts of COVID-19? Yeah, sure. I, um, look, I see a lot of young people and my staff see even more. Um, and I also have a year 11 slash year 12 at home. So mm. I have a bit of a lived experience too. Uh, look, I think young people generally are incredibly resilient and they do us proud. And I feel very proud of my children for actually being able to coordinate their remote learning. I'm, I'm quite flabbergasted that while I sit in this room and talk to people on the screen, they go out and they organise themselves in ways that, frankly, I wouldn't have thought were possible. Um, at work, I, I also am amazed by what young people are holding and working with. Um, a lot of them are doing immense jobs and worried about others and worried about their friends and their families. And, and so I think my message is that young people are are doing a pretty good job, really. We we did have a dip in referrals to Headspace and that has now returned. Um, and with that, I think people have perhaps have slightly more complex issues because they've put off help seeking. Um, so in terms of supporting others, you know, there's all the stuff we've talked about 
the suggestions and the ways you can cope and the ways you can get people to trust and open up to you. But there's also the encouraging people. Like if, if someone does tell you that they're having problems, um, encourage them to get help earlier. Encourage them to do something. Encourage them to reach out to another. Encourage their connection. Try and think of creative ways. You know, move, movie nights on Zoom, the one person they can go for a walk with, um, other ways that they can kind of connect and have relationships. Um, because I do think that young people forget how important socialising is. They, they know it's important, but they think they can only do it one way. And sometimes they just need that little bit of scaffolding because we all do feel a bit better after we've talked to a mate. Mm, and also, um, there is a bit of a misconception that mental health um, support workers, whether it's psychiatrists, counsellors, etc., are overwhelmed during this time with an inundated with patients. But that that's really not the case. I'm sure Sophie can support this. People <laughs> should be seeking help if they really need it. Um, these people are, are there to help us. And if they were overbooked, they would definitely be the first to tell us. So, you know, in general, don't say, say to yourself, oh, you know, they've got a lot going on. And I don't want to burden them with my troubles. That's, I'm sure that's not the case. And I'm sure the panel here agrees. Absolutely. And we will prioritise. So we will try and figure out what the problem is and we will then try and figure out how quickly we try and address it. Um, but by all means, you should just seek help. There, we, are, we, are, we are busy, but we are not that much more busy than normal and we will flex up and down and prioritise and, and, and shuffle our resources. And I've just spent hours today talking to my most flexible team, trying to figure out how they're going to outreach into schools and into youth councils and all the places, EDs, where kids are to try and make sure that they come to us because at the moment we know they're going to EDs but they're not coming as much to Headspace and so we want to do everything we can to get people in early. Definitely and it's really great that these services are available to us Victorians. Um, another question here, there are often comments about what we are missing out on, the freedom to move outside rather than what we can do more in our immediate environment. Are there any other similar tidbits from our alumni watching in uh, how they can uh, practice mindfulness within this tighter bu bubble? Oh, I'm happy to. No, Sky, you go. No, 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 you go. <laughs> no, both <laughs> of you can go. It's all good. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for Martin's response. So it's, it, they've been good. Um, I'm, I'm ready to, he's been inspiring me and motivating me. So I, I, think, we, I think we need it. <laughs> I, 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 just, I think the one thing about it is that knowing, knowing that we're all different. So a lot of time people, they talk about mindfulness and these are things to do. They don't all work for everyone. You've, you've, firstly, you've got to know that. And two, they take a lot of bloody practice. Right? So what I'd say to everyone on this call is, what's your skill set? How long did it take you to acquire those skills? All right, well, that's the same with this. So quite often people are in for the quick fix. What's the quick fix? They think they can do something new and then they look for the results, but the results, they're not there. They're increments. It's like when you go see your best friend's three-month-old baby. You, you haven't seen them for three months. You go, geez, they've grown. But the person, they, they, go, they haven't grown at all. Because they're in that moment. So there's many things. I'll just be real quick. The simple ones, like, for, like so many, obviously meditation, breathing techniques, colouring in is phenomenal. It, don't neglect it because you think it's for kids. Colouring in is sensational. Find something that you're passionate about, colour it in. Yoga, origami, puzzles are sensational. We've got, I've got a 1,500-piece puzzle. It's, it, sometimes I have to do another mindfulness activity afterwards because I do get a bit frustrated because I can't complete it. Lego, exactly. Like There's so many things. Flow states. Flow is not mindfulness, but it is heavily linked. Flow is when you're doing something, you're in the moment. Nothing else is entering your mind. It allows you. For some people, it might be going for a walk. I know we can't swim in pools. We will be able to in the future. A lot of people find their flow when they're swimming in a pool. There's so many things that you can do, but you've got to give them a chance to be embedded. That's what I'd say. And where people stuff up is they don't allow them to become embedded. And one size does not fit all. I'm different to you. You're different to me. You've got to work out what works for you. Sorry, Sky, you go. No, I, I loved everything that you said. Um, I, I, I 
think um, it was all great suggestions. I, the only thing I was going to add um, is that um, I think it's important to remember that, you know, there, there's, there's doing mindfulness, um, which, you know, as Martin sort of alluded to, actually um, can take quite a bit of practice sometimes. But there's also just being mindful, um, which I think comes back to, to Sophie's sort of earlier point around having space to think. Um, so even if you're, you know, don't necessarily have... Um, the time or the inclination or, or the skill set to do some of the um, activities that fall under sort of the mindfulness umbrella, even just giving your, your space, uh, yourself space to be mindful, to just think about stuff, to just, to, just, to even just vegetate, um, it, you know, for a bit on the couch um, and, and reflect on the day can be really useful um, in and of itself. Definitely. Brothers, do you want to add anything? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you go, Martin. No, I was just going to quickly say, um, I, I know you don't want to be on the phones too much, but apps, they're a great ones. Headspace. So if you, Headspace has got an amazing app. Um, Calm, Happy Ways, Buddhify 2, Waking Up with Sam. There's a lot out there that you can look into. We've got one as well, but the others are fantastic. And, and they're really, I suppose, beneficial for you to be able to put into play as well. Sorry, Brock. No, I was just going to say, and Sky mentioned this before, but I, I actually, I'm pretty bad at mindfulness, but I find exercise is really mindful activity for me. I, I can't think about anything in the past and the future when I'm just trying to keep going. So, you know, I think that that, that kind of keeps you focused on the present quite well. And, and exercise just generally, I think at the moment, it just it's just going to serve so many mental health benefits. Um, and it can't, I don't think we can talk highly enough of how important it is um, for mental health. The, and and the, uh, the benefits are immediate. It happens. It happens immediately afterwards. It's not. It's not a build up. It's like there straight away. So that's yeah. good to remember. All right, guys. That's all. All the time we have for questions today. Unfortunately, we couldn't answer them all. Um, so as we come to the end of this discussion, I'd like to get some closing advice from our fantastic panelists on the key tip or takeaway you would give early early career professionals or indeed any of our participants trying to navigate the post-COVID career world or even the world more generally. So we'll start with Sophie. I just think it's really important to keep in mind that the world has so many possibilities from this, that, that this event, as difficult and hard as it is, is creating opportunities for rethinking the world. And actually, if you're early in your career, this is a great time in some ways because the world will be a bit different and you're going to help shape that. Thank you, Sky. Uh, I mean, Sophie, Sky, next. Um, I guess, you know, the, the take-home that I would probably say is um, just be kind to yourself. Um, you know, this, this is a difficult time. You don't have to get it right all of the time. Um, you know, uh, the... the We've, talk, we've talked a lot about the challenges and the opportunities for growth and, and some days you, you're not really going to um, be, be comforted by that. Um, you, you're just going to be sick of it and frustrated and, and, and that's okay. It's okay to have those days. It's, it's um, I guess, you know, to uh, draw on some of the themes that Martin's said before, it's, it's the resilience, it's the getting back up, um, you know, it's, it's the waking up the next day and um, trying again. Mm, definitely. And Martin? Any last words? Uh, just keep finding the positive emotions. You know, find ways to get them and, um, and appreciate the small things in your world and, and connection's huge. So maintain connection with your loved ones, with your family members, uh, friends. And lastly, we've got Brock. Any final words for our audience? Uh, I, I guess maybe, you know, try and, try and find those silver linings if you can. Um, be, be flexible and if that doesn't work out, do what Sky said and just um, be kind to yourself because it's probably, you know, it's a hard time and it's going to get, it's going to be tough and you're not always going to get it right. So, yeah. Definitely. Um, so I'd like to encourage you all to consider sharing the insights from your own career journey with our current students through the Ask Alumni Mentoring Program. Um, our online platform allows students to reach out to alumni, have one-off 30-minute conversations over the phone by video conference or in person. So it is convenient for anyone from around the world to be a mentor. Your advice and support can help give current students the best start to their career. So please watch out for our upcoming Ask Alumni Love webinars over the coming months. And also, um, I'd like to thank all the panellists for their awesome advice and for the discussion today um, 
extra resources. So I'd like to also highlight some fantastic online resources currently being offered for alumni and students on mindfulness, resilience and wellbeing. If you have enjoyed tonight's session, I encourage you to jump online and register for one of these. Um, we also, um, we've also added details and links to other resources on this slide. So if anyone you or if you or anyone you know needs the support needs support during this time please make sure you reach out and encourage others to reach out to some of these services they are there to help um, finally I would like to let you know that we also have a number of other online events coming up next week we have alumni hour a conversation with associate professor Luke Birchall a Melbourne Medical School alum and Australia's first Aboriginal cardiologist who is on a mission to achieve health equity you can register for this event um, by searching alumni hour or via the link on the screen um, and stay tuned for the next Ask Alumni event in October, guiding you through landing the job applications and interviews. Lastly, I'd like to thank again, Brock, Sophie, Martin and Sky. It's been fascinating talking to each of you and to learn from you, from your expertise and experiences. And on behalf of all of those who participated in this event, I'd like to offer my sincere, um, sincere thanks to you for giving the time to share your your insights and advice. Until next time, goodbye everyone and we wish you the best with your career journey.